So a natural question to ask here right out the gate is why is there a paper about the minimum wage on a program for a conference called Tax Policy in the Economy? And uh, the short and glib answer, which, uh, which Jeff gave me via email, was, well, people get excited about the minimum wage, so let's put it on the program and see how it goes. Uh, but there are also a couple of more substantive uh, reasons. So the first is that traditionally when we think about sort of ways that we redistribute uh, resources through public policy, we focus on the progressive income tax or any of a variety of tax and transfer programs. But it's also the case that a significant amount of redistributive activity takes place uh, by way of regulation. So this includes a variety of mandated benefits, specifically uh, employer mandates, it includes, um, for example, rent control uh, type of arrangements. It includes premium regulations that are enforced on, on health insurance providers. And it also includes the, um, the minimum wage. And so when we think about how all of these different types of redistributive policies fit together, you know, we need to kind of think comprehensively about whether these regulatory mechanisms might be more or less effective than these traditional tax and transfer mechanisms in various environments. To what extent might these two approaches be, you know, complementary versus being uh, substitutes, uh, or being being uh, substitutes for one another? And a second reason that, that it's of interest to focus on on uh, redistribution through minimum ra wage regulation in, in the context of a conference like this is that these regulatory redistributive efforts potentially have fiscal consequences. And so a big part of uh, what I'm doing in in this particular paper is to is to look at some of the budgetary implications of uh, minimum wage regulations. So something that I try to emphasize in this paper and that I'll try to emphasize throughout this talk is that these redistributive regulations turn out to be quite difficult policies to evaluate in practice. So in the context of the minimum wage, this is sort of, in, at least in terms, of the, in terms of popular press and popular discussion, is embodied most directly by the kind of widespread disagreement over the minimum wage's effects on employment. But it really goes much deeper than that um, in that there are kind of an, a wide range of nuanced uh, effects that minimum wages might have on the economy. So in particular, you can think of things like uh, uh, employer adjustments on the quality of workplace conditions, their provision of, of training to their, work, um, to, to their workers and, and effects uh, of this sort. So in this paper, what I'm going to highlight and what I'm going to focus on are program and budgetary spillover effects of minimum wage regulation. So why are program spillovers relevant? Well, in the context of minimum wage regulation, one of the chief concerns that we have when we increase the minimum wage is that you might see some decline in employment. And when you go and you try to evaluate how the minimum wage impacts the well-being of the individuals that it targets, there are going to be kind of two comp potentially competing effects, one being the increases in the, in the incomes or earnings of the individuals who m are able to maintain employment at the new minimum wage, but then also the losses to individuals who lose their jobs. And the losses to the individuals who lose their jobs, as it turns out, will be very much mediated by the extent to which their lost earned income you know, gets replaced by transfers through programs like unemployment insurance, food stamps, or sort of other forms of, of means-tested uh, means assistance. Second, just as kind of a general part of the uh, program evaluation apparatus, you know, it's, in, it's important to keep, keep track of the, the broader fiscal consequences. And minimum wage changes can potentially have a variety of you know, impacts on, on, um, on, on public budgets, both state and local and, and, of course, federal, through impacts on revenue streams, through, for example, payroll tax uh, revenues, through the personal income tax, through earned income tax credit payments. And it turns out that tracing uh, through all of these effects is quite difficult. And the Congressional Budget Office's sort of approach the last time that it was asked about this question was essentially to say, well, at least on the revenue side, there are a bunch of effects to a first approximation, they'll probably cancel out. And as it turns out, that's basically going to be the conclusion that I have on, on a variety of the, these things, having taken my whack at, at thinking, uh, thinking ver fairly hard about the problem. A point that I want to be sure to emphasize uh, very carefully is that both of these types of effects could and likely will depend very much on the macroeconomic context into which a minimum wage increase is, is enacted. So if a minimum wage increase is enacted in a relatively uh, tight labor market, you might expect disemployment effects to be relatively small, as a result of which you're going to see you know, increases in the earnings of, of low-skilled individuals, relatively little um, in the way of them you know, experiencing kind of increases in payments through means-tested uh, transfer programs, possibly some crowding out of, of, uh, of these tax finance uh, transfer arrangements. Um, whereas if you enact an, a minimum wage increase in a relatively slack labor market, 
um, you, you might expect to see more of the latter. So you'll tend to see more uh, disemployment effects and potentially lost payroll tax revenue and, and increases in spending through other programs. And so something that I want to be very, very clear about uh, in the course of this talk, is, as we'll see as I talk about the particular setting that I analyze, I'll be analyzing the minimum wage increases that sort of went into effect during the last round of federal minimum wage um, increases, uh, which went into effect during the Great Recession. And so I think that that very likely colors uh, the, the results that I find, which are going to be of the variety that there were fairly significant uh, disemployment effects, and as a result, declines in payroll tax revenues and some substitution onto uh, onto other programs. So with that by way of introduction, I'd like to kind of get, get right on into the, into the body of the talk. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the, this, this very particular setting in which I'll be analyzing these minimum wage increases, and then I'll get right on into talking about the outcomes of interest. So sort of showing the kind of first stage or first wave effect of these minimum wage changes on the wage distributions of the individuals that I've brought into my analysis sample, and then proceeding on into analysis of effects on employment, on the earnings distribution, and on these program and, and uh, t tax, uh, tax spillover uh, outcomes of, of particular interest for this conference. Okay, so, so the analysis that I've conducted uh, for this paper involves the most recent round of increases in the federal minimum wage, and, and I'll be taking advantage of the fact that these latest federal minimum wage increases were, as I'll show you in a moment, very much differentially abiding across states, meaning that there's going to be a natural kind of treatment and, and, and control group setting. Uh, for this audience in particular, I think it's, it's always interesting to think about the legislative history of, of various reforms. So these particular minimum wage increases were implemented through the, or enacted through the U.S. Troop Readiness, Veterans Care, Katrina Recovery, and Iraq Accountability Appropriations Act of 2007. This was, of course, an emergency supplemental, which is how we tend to do, you know, all of our all of our landmark labor uh, labor law and, and and regulation. Specifically, there's almost always some version of, of what has a name of something like the Fair Wage Act, kind of sitting around off the shelf. And in this particular case, that was tucked into an uh, into an emergency supplemental, which a cynic might be inclined to think basically was just a list of things that President Bush would be unable to veto under any circumstances. So, you know, he was in no position to veto the troops, the veterans, uh, Katrina victims, or accountability in Iraq, or at least maybe the latter he was hoping to duck. But uh, in any case, uh, that, was, that was the bill. It was passed in May 2007. The minimum wage changes went into effect in July 2007, 2008, and 2009, with the first bringing the effective minimum wage from $5.15 to $5.85. The 2008 increase, bringing it from uh, 585 to 655, and the 2009 increase, bringing it from 655 to 725. Okay, the analysis is going to take place using uh, the data set known as the Survey of Income and Program Participation. And so this, is, this has sort of very specific implications for which of these, of these federal minimum wage increases I'll be able to analyze. So the sample kind of is fully up and running in the 2008 SIP panel in August of 2008, and then runs for four years. And so what that means is that I'll be able to follow low-skilled workers through this last of these three increments of the increase in the federal minimum wage, i.e. through the July 2009 increase in the federal minimum wage. And one advantage of having the individual level longitudinal data from the SIP is that I can use people's self-reported wage information from August 2008 through July 2009 in order to select analysis samples which are sort of precisely the workers whose wages were such that they would be impacted by this change in the, this change in the minimum wage. And as, as we show, or as, as a, as a co-author and I show in sort of a first paper uh, that we wrote using, using this particular setting, this gives us the ability to kind of target analysis samples that are affected by the minimum wage to a pretty significantly uh, greater degree than analysis samples that are, say, just selected on the basis of people being, uh, being teenagers, which is one of the standard approaches uh, in the literature. Okay, to, to provide you with a sense of how these minimum wage increases sort of went into effect across states and, and how we're going to set up our, our, our states that were uh, bound by these increases and that were not bound, if we look at what we have in the graph here, the red dashed line is plotting out the average effective minimum wage in the states that we uh, designated in this, in this first paper as being unbound by the federal minimum wage, mean, meaning essentially that the minimum wage rates in these states were already above the new federal, uh, federal minimum uh, far, below, far before that went into effect. So among these states, the average effective minimum wage, as you can see, was basically at or, or above $7.25 an hour as of January 2008, 
And as a consequence of that, these states were not bound by either the July 2008 or the July 2009 increases in the federal minimum. When we turn to the other states that we've designated as being bound, we see that the July 2007, July 2008, and July 2009 increments were all essentially fully binding. And the way that you can see that on the graph is that the blue solid line increases by essentially 70 cents um, at, each of those at each of those points in time. So essentially all of the states in this group that we designate as being bound basically had their minimum wage rates set at the federal minimum and moved in lockstep with the federal minimum. So as I noted on the previous slide, this SIP uh, sample that we'll be analyzing gets into gear in August 2008, and so what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to follow these individuals through the July 2009 increase in the minimum wage and then follow their outcomes for another three years uh, following that binding increase in the federal minimum wage. Hey, here's the, the map of states. It might not be surprising to learn that the states that were bound by the federal minimum wage increase were primarily red states, whereas the states that were unbound by the federal minimum wage were primarily blue states, or dark blue and, and light blue, as I've shown them here. And so in the context of this previous paper, where uh, my co-author Michael Wither and I were really focused on the employment effects as opposed to on these kind of budgetary spillover effects that I'm emphasizing today, um, we spend a great deal of time kind of exploring the extent to which our analysis is sensitive to uh, alternative approaches to controlling for how the Great Recession uh, varied in its severity across, across these groups, groups of states, which is an important concern, but our baseline approach turns out to be quite, um, quite robust. So things to note, in the context of that, of that previous paper, we did engage in, a, in an extensive robustness analysis uh, for, for the basic approach that, that, I'll, that I'll show you momentarily. The estimated employment effects turned out to be substantial, and as I emphasized uh, previously, we think that this is very much a product of the particulars of the macroeconomic environment into which these minimum wage increases were, uh, were injected. This paper is now going to pick up with the kind of baseline from that previous paper, and we're going to explore the extent to which the job losers that we identified in that previous paper saw their income declines cushioned by increases in receipts through transfer programs and then also look at kind of broader uh, implications for, uh, for public budgets. Okay, our estimation strategy is a pretty standard uh, difference in differences style estimation framework where essentially what we'll be doing is we'll be tracing out the differential change in outcomes such as employment or program participation among the low skilled individuals in our sample that are in these states that were bound by the increase in the minimum wage relative to the low skilled individuals who were in states that were, uh, that were not bound by the minimum wage. Okay, so let's move on ahead into the, uh, into the results and the outcomes of interest. So starting out by just showing that we have in fact selected samples that were very much affected by the change in the minimum wage. This figure that you can see now basically shows this point. So again, the, the red dashed line is going to be plotting out outcomes for individuals who are from states that were not bound by the federal minimum wage increase. The blue solid line will be plotting out outcomes for individuals who were in states that were bound by the increase. And basically the way that we've selected these samples is we've selected them to contain individuals whose average wage during our baseline period was less than 750. So among these individuals, what we can see in this figure is that prior to the binding federal minimum wage increase, about 40% of the months um, in which we observe the individuals in the bound states were months in which they reported having a wage that was between the old federal minimum wage and the new federal minimum wage. And that's higher than the fraction of time that was spent with such jobs um, among the individuals in the bound states by about 20 percentage points. So that's gonna be a pretty significant bite in terms, of, in terms of our ability to kind of have samples that are actually being affected by, uh, affected by the policy of interest. We then see convergence between April and uh, July 2009. We think this involves a combination of, of statistical and sort of real economic factors. So the real economic factor would be that if you're planning on hiring a minimum wage worker at some point over the summer, you're planning to keep them kind of on payroll for some period of time, you might just post the job uh, as being at that federal minimum wage that's gonna be binding, even if you're hiring them in say April or, or May. So there might be a little bit of kind of lead um, anticipation of the federal minimum wage increase on the part of employers. The statistical issue, which I won't, I won't go into great detail at the moment, involves, um, involves what's, what's known as seen bias or kind of look back bias within the SIP. So specifically the SIP is, is obtaining wage information 
uh, on four month intervals and it's asking people about their wages over the prior four months and so one concern that can arise in that setting is that people will just sort of report the same wage for all four months even if in fact their wage was changing. And so to account for this econometrically, kind of whether it's anticipation and kind of real economic forces or the statistical issue, we basically in our estimation framework just allow for a transition period that's going to kind of allow the dynamics of this policy to play out in a way that, that's kind of different in, the, in that transition period. And then again, we're also going to kind of trace out differences between the first year following the enactment of the policy change and, and then subsequent or kind of medium run um, outcomes of interest. Okay, the next thing that I'm gonna do is show you a sort of more flexible look at the effect of these minimum wage changes on the wage distribution. And I, I do this for two reasons. One is that I think it's, a, it's somewhat interesting in its own right, but second, it's also gonna prep us for some of the way that I present some of the other outcomes going forward. So what I'm gonna show you on the next slide is gonna be a figure which will have a bunch of dots on it. Each dot is going to represent an estimate of the change in the probability that an individual has a wage in sort of a, in a relatively narrow band. So specifically, say between $5.50 an hour, uh, sorry, specifically five, between $5 and $5.50, or between $5.50 and $6, $6 and $6.50. And basically what I'll be able to show you in this first figure is that these minimum wage increases do show up as very much kind of binding in the region of the wage distribution that they were, that they were intended to bind. And so that's what I'm showing you in this figure. So the, the low dot that's associated with the $6.50 to $7 an hour range indicates that the individuals in the bound states, sort of going from this baseline period to the subsequent periods, saw roughly a 15 percentage point decline in their probability of reporting a wage in sort of this very narrow region that was, that was bound by the new federal minimum wage. And the high dot up at about uh, 0.12 on the, on the y-axis that falls between 7 and 750 indicates that kind of most of these individuals who were shifted out of the region that's now been regulated out of existence are indeed kind of shifted to wages that are at or very close to the new federal minimum of, of 725. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to just provide the summary uh, estimates of the employment effects that, um, that Michael Wither and I picked up in, in, our, in our previous paper, and then, I'll, and then I'll move on to these other outcomes of interest. So over the short run, we pick up a four percentage point decline in the employment of the individuals, of these targeted indiv individuals in bound states relative to targeted individuals in unbound states. Over the medium run, we pick up a six percentage point decline. And then in terms of people's earnings, we find that this is a little bit augmented by modest increases in the probability of reporting that you're working but that your primary job does not have any income, which we interpret as being something like an internship effect, i.e. that some minimum wage employment shifted to being sort of like an unpaid internship as opposed to having a wage at the, at the higher new minimum. And so the medium run effect on, on the combined outcome of either being unemployed or having a primary job that does not have any earnings associated with it was eight percentage point. So we spent a fair amount of time thinking about the, the forces that likely contribute to this. So one is to note that, as I've been emphasizing throughout, these were minimum wage increases that were enacted in a very weak labor market, you know, the weakest in the last 75 years since the, since the Great Depression. A set that, second thing to note is that these minimum wage increases were binding in states that were low cost of living states. So if you raise, if you raise the minimum wage to 725, in the, the DC area or in California, you know, that's gonna, that's gonna bite at a much lower portion of the wage distribution than it turned out to bite in, in the states where it was binding, which were primarily uh, southern states and other kind of red-leaning red states. And so when you look at where this falls sort of relative to medium, median wage, it, was, it tended to be between 40 and 50 percent among these, among these states. A third thing that, that Michael Wither and I have been, have been uh, exploring in, in the context of, of a separate paper is that these red states also tended to have very low Medicaid eligibility thresholds. And it's such that it's basically become impossible to have anything more than say 10 hours a week of employment in these states and maintain eligibility for Medicaid. And so we think that some of this decline in employment that we observe is actually on the su labor supply side, i.e. people kind of voluntarily exiting the labor force in light of their inability to find a job that would actually allow them to maintain uh, their, their Medicaid benefits. And so this is, I think this is incredibly important just in general in the context of, of analyses of, of minimum wage increases, is that it's almost always treated as though the estimate that pops out is going to tell us something about an elasticity of demand for labor supply, but there are a ton of other effects that can be at work. And these things sort of n knowing which effects might or might not be relevant requires being pretty intimate with the full sort of slate of programs uh, for which, or in transfers for which these individuals uh, might, be, might be eligible. How am, I, how am I doing on time? Mm. Uh, you've got about five more minutes. Okay. 
Okay, so now let's look to the earnings distribution. So much like the figure before, basically what we're seeing are changes in the probability of individuals in bound states relative to individuals in the unbound states of having earnings in these, in these various bins. What's interesting when you look at the relatively short run or the first year is that almost all of the action kind of shows up in monthly earnings bins that would be associated with either part or full-time work at the minimum wage. Since we're a little bit short on time, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to kind of walk through, the, walk through the details of that, but I want to point out that it's one thing that we found very interesting is that when we move to kind of year two and year three effects, or what we call the medium run, that actually changes somewhat. So what we start to pick up um, are slight declines in the probability that affected individuals kind of rise up in the earnings distributions to earnings that would be associated with slightly higher than minimum wage earnings levels. And this is interesting in the context of thinking about kind of the importance of, of on-the-job training and experience accumulation for the, for the development of human capital and the kind of, um, you know, just sort of broader issues of, issues of social mobility. It's something that, that, I'm, that I'm hoping to explore further in, in future work. Okay, now we get into some of these, the, the issues of kind of um, potential offsets of these earnings declines uh, through, through transfer payments. So essentially what we find when we go to look at what happens to the total income in, of these individuals is that the change in total income is quite similar to the change in earnings, meaning that we see very little replacement of this lost income through increases in, in, uh, in income from other sources. I'll say a little bit why, about why I think that's the case um, in a moment. When we look at the income distribution, what we see is that the kind of severe outcome of having no earnings does appear to be kind of blunted to some extent, i.e. it's more like you throw up as having sort of relatively low kind of $200 to $400 um, income, and that's reflecting the, the effect of these transfer programs uh, doing, doing something to cushion the earnings losses of, of these folks. Okay. So as we saw there, there was relatively little offset kind of in total of the, of the incomes, uh, sorry, of the, of the lost earnings of these individuals. Now I'm going to kind of break that out across a variety of different programs. So on this slide, this table is showing you changes in the probability of having any income from a variety of different programs, including means-tested cash assistance, food assistance, unemployment insurance, uh, social security, or any of, those, any of those four programs. And sort of consistent what we saw in terms of there being very little kind of overall income replacement, the estimates for, for all of these programs are, are quite close to zero. So there's very little action, maybe a little bit on the means-tested cash assistance. I think there are probably a few things going on here. So one is that many people who make the minimum wage are in households that actually have moderately higher incomes, such that the loss of the earnings of the minimum wage individual might or might not you know, actually impact your eligibility for various forms of benefits. A second, sort of, which is particularly salient in the context of unemployment insurance, is that minimum wage workers tend to have relatively short and relatively unstable work histories, and as a result, might not actually be eligible for unemployment insurance, or to the extent that they are, might be eligible for benefits that are so small that it ultimately is not worthwhile for them to, to claim those benefits. A third issue, which is a problem with, with the data, um, it's something that we might just might not pick up, is that we know that these very forms of, of uh, means-tested uh, transfer program assistance are, are sort of tend to be underreported by individuals in the survey of income and program participation, and so it may be that I'm just sort of failing to pick up uh, some amount of, of, of uh, income replacement through these programs. But you can note that these estimates are, are sufficiently small, in particular when I turn to the dollar values on the next slide, that even if you thought that I was sort of failing to pick up half of the income that was coming through these transfer programs, the, the income replacement would still be a pretty small fraction of, of the lost earnings. Okay, next I turn to the tax side, where I can do a very straightforward analysis of changes in payroll tax revenues, sort of precisely because I can directly impute payroll tax revenues as being some constant rate times the change in earnings. So that turns out to be relatively straightforward. And this works in large part because the ceilings on the collection in particular of Social Security and Medicare, and Medicare um, payroll taxes are way beyond kind of what any of these individuals would plausibly be making over the course of a calendar year. So just directly applying the rate seems to, seems to be the most reasonable thing to do. Even for unemployment insurance where the ceilings are relatively low, if you kind of do the math, you're going to find that very little of, um, that, that, that very few of these, of these individuals actually have income from a single job that would get them, uh, get them up over the, over the threshold. So the overall estimate for change in payroll tax is $29 uh, per person uh, per month over the, over the medium run. I'll put that into aggregate context uh, on this next slide. So for inputs to a back of the envelope calculation of the aggregate in-sample effect on payroll tax revenue, 
we just need the following information. So the target population, kind of applying the SIPs sample weights, accounts for about seven million individuals. Importantly, this is, this is the target population in the bound states. So if you were kind of thinking about the full slate of these individuals, you would just, you would just double that. The decline in monthly payroll tax is $29.4 per person. So you multiply the seven million times the $29.4 times 12 months, it gets you an estimate of $2.5 billion in kind of in-sample lost payroll tax revenues over the course of the year. Pretty sizable standard error on that estimate of, of, uh, of $1 billion. Okay, if we do the same for the uh, benefit expenditures that, that we picked up, which again, as I've emphasized, was picked up relatively imprecisely, we again have the target population of seven million individuals. The estimated change in monthly benefit receipt was $11.8 .8 per person per month. And so that gives us seven million times 11.8 .8 times 12 months or $1 billion in sort of in sample increases in, in benefit receipt. And that also comes with a standard error of roughly $1 billion. So kind of, you know, no ability to kind of uh, distinguish that uh, distinguish that from zero, reflecting the small estimates that I had to begin with. Okay, I'll transition now into, into a single uh, concluding slide. So as I, as I emphasized at the top, the program and budgetary spillovers of the sort that I've focused on in this presentation are quite important as policy making inputs. This is true in particular kind of in the context of the minimum wage, as I've emphasized, when we think about the fact that programs like unemployment insurance or food stamps or other means-tested assistance might in principle serve as a, cush a cushion to the incomes of anyone who loses their job after uh, the minimum wage increases. One thing that's very frustrating in terms of engaging in research of this sort is that there are very few data sources, the SIP kind of being the principal one, that actually makes an effort to collect information from individuals on the full set of, of um, the full set of receipts through these various sources. Uh, the fact that it's a, you know, that it's a survey data set as opposed to administrative data set is an impediment to really getting a, you know, a complete understanding of what's going on um, in this, this universe. And I'll simply close out by just emphasizing that, you know, budgetary spillovers can take place through a very, very broad uh, range of channels. These effects are likely to depend significantly on, on uh, macroeconomic conditions. And so as a result, the, the good people at, you know, at CBO and JCT who are charged with attempting to do these kinds of you know, macroeconomic uh, projections or, 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 uh, or, or budget, budgetary projections ha definitely have my, my sympathies.